Hello, and welcome to Keep the Channel Open, a podcast featuring conversations with artists, writers, and curators. My name is Mike Sakasagawa, and this is episode 97. Today's guest is Bin Don. Hello, one and all. Welcome to the show. Today's guest is photographer Bin Don. Bin Don emerged as an artist of national importance with work that investigates his Vietnamese heritage and our collective memory of war. His technique incorporates his invention of the chlorophyll printing process, in which photographic images appear embedded in leaves through the action of photosynthesis. His newer body of work focuses on 19th century photographic processes, applying them in an investigation of battlefield landscapes and contemporary memorials. A recent series of daguerreotypes celebrated the United States National Park System during its anniversary year. His work is in the permanent collections of the National Gallery of Art, the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art, the de Young Museum, the Philadelphia Museum of Art, the Center for Creative Photography, the George Eastman Museum, and many others. He received the 2010 Eureka Fellowship from the Fleischhacker Foundation, and in 2012 he was a featured artist at the 18th Biennial of Sydney in Australia. He is represented by Haynes Gallery in San Francisco, California, and Lisa Set Gallery in Phoenix, Arizona. He lives and works in San Jose, California, and teaches photography at San Jose State University. Now, I first saw Ben's work at the Medium Festival of Photography a few years ago when he was one of the presenting lecturers. I think that was in 2015. And that lecture has always stood out in my mind for several reasons. Uh, one, he was one of the first Asian American photographers whose work I got to see, so that was exciting for me. But also, those chlorophyll prints that I just mentioned are the kind of thing that you just don't forget. Basically, he's doing something a little bit like a photogram and a little bit like a traditional print, but instead of light-sensitive paper, he uses leaves. He puts a negative directly onto a leaf and then leaves it in the sun, and through the natural process of photosynthesis, the image becomes part of the leaf. Now, the technique itself is impressive enough, but what's really amazing about Bin's work is the way he uses the technique to create images about war and landscape and aftermath, and the form of the work perfectly embodies the concept in a way that is just, well, perfect. So, as you can imagine, I was pleased to get the chance to talk with him. Bin also uses the daguerreotype process in a lot of his newer work, and as luck would have it, if you're in the San Francisco area, you can actually see some of his daguerreotypes in person. And this is work that really does need to be seen in person for the full impact. So, through November 2nd, 2019, head over to Haynes Gallery, and you can see Bin's exhibition after the gold rush. All right, let's get started. Here's my conversation with Bin Don. So how are you today? I'm good. I'm good. It's uh, it's always a busy week. You know, when I'm teaching, um, when school starts again, it's everything is focused on on school, and it's good. And tonight, tonight is also my opening, so it's nerve wracking a little bit, but mm. I'm, I'm well. <laughs> yeah. So I was looking at the press release for your opening tonight for your new exhibition, the title of which is. Uh, after the gold rush. So that's at uh, Haynes Gallery, right? Correct. Yeah, I hadn't seen this work before, which I guess makes sense if it's a brand new <laughs> exhibition. But um, but this is sort of continuing your daguerreotype work, yeah? Yeah, it's um, the daguerreotype process I've been working on for, um, i say maybe a good decade now, but it's continuing that sort of landscape photography interest I have. So the work that of yours that I've seen, it sort of falls, well, I actually went and looked through, uh, your, your portfolio some more when, as I was prepping and found some work that, that I wasn't very familiar with, but just the broadly, the two sort of categories of your images that I sort of knew were these daguerreotype images and, uh, your, uh, chlorophyll prints Uh huh. with these daguerreotype images. One of the things that I've always been really interested in is the way that these, photographs are really engaging with history, both in the subject matter and in the process. And I was kind of wondering if we could talk about that a little bit, about how, you know, why is the this historical aspect interesting to you and important to you? 
So particularly about the daguerreotype process? Yeah, not, but it's not just the process, right? Because like, I mean, this is a very historic process. It's the, the, right. but it's also the subject matter that you're picking. Like, for example, in this new show after the gold rush, you're photographing Nevada City. And this has, um, it's a, it's a very historic place that has to do with California history, the gold rush, all of these different types of things. And I'm, I'm, I'm interested in, in what it is about this historical aspect that really attracts you. I see. Well, you know, I think history in general, it's something that's always fascinated me since, um, I was, since I was a child. <laughs> because, you know, I mean, I think growing up, um, Vietnamese American and coming to this country, um, and not knowing that history of Vietnam other than if it was a war, my parents rarely talk about their own history. So it's always, it's something that I constantly think about, like what, what makes, yeah, what's this, what's this, what are these stories of the past and what makes them us today in a way? So all that kind of just magnify my work somehow, just always the idea of history looking back into the past. Mm. And, you know, cause you know, photography in general, it's about history. Mm-hmm. Um, the photographs we made are pictures of the past. And I always like to remind people too, is that photographers are also people of who think about the future. Mm. They're recording things for the future. Um, so then those history will, will be lost in, in, in some way through, you know, through imageries or through discussion of the work, through revisiting a site, through just pondering about time. You know, for photograph, it's basically recording time. Mm. You know, some of my work is personal, other, like the Nevada City work. I wouldn't say it's personal in a way, but it's, California history, I guess it's gold rush history, but it's also Asian American history. It's not much of the evidence of Asian Americans there today, but, you know, you imagine during the 1840s, basically around the same time photography was coming around, there was, there was a lot of Chinese labor working in those gold mines. Um, and of course, you know, not a lot of those photographs (laughs) were made of them. In just only recently, I guess maybe in the last the last decade or so, that there's there's been a, a lot of more um, inclusion of Chinese American history in that period of um, of uh, California history, you know. And I think a lot of it more is just done um, pushed by the community, you know, not um, wanting to be written out of history mm. because uh, visually it wasn't there and. I think we uh, we understand. I think majority lay people understand history through photographs. Mm. You know, I think for me as just a uh, a photographer and artist, I'm trying to include <laughs> my own history, my own community's history. Mm. Yeah. So that's that's. I mean, that's one reason why I'm so drawn to history. And of course, history is fascinating. Uh, there's it's endless, right? There's subject matters for anything and you can go beyond human time if you want. So mm. that's all fascinating with me too. And I, I think about, yeah, I think about the property of a, of a daguerreotype, the elements, the chemicals, the atoms that compose these materials. Right. Um, um, and it kind of something that I talk a lot about when I think about my core field prints is that it's, very, it's scientific, right? The, 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 the photography and science is, of course, very related. Although uh, maybe today we don't think about that kind of chemical based or analog science. You mm-hmm. know, photography today we think more of a, of a technology, right? But, mm. you know, technology is, we always think about it's like happening right now. But of course, technology is like the first, uh, stone tool, right? Is a form of early technology for those early humans. So I always talk about when I talk about the chlorophyll printing um, process and like the, the, the atoms that compose the leaf or the atoms that compose our body, like each atom has layers and layers of history on it um, because they've always been around, right? It's like mm. we, we die <laughs> as, as um, living 
beings, we die, but the atoms get kind of recycled, right? Yeah. In the universe. And I'm just mesmerized and amazed by just the idea that um, all of these atoms are just other stuff and other, uh, other objects throughout time, you mm. know, since the beginning of the universe. So it's all, it's all interconnected. <laughs> you know, it could be some recent events, but something could go back to the beginning of time, the, you know, what we call the Big Bang. And um, all that is trying to connect all of us together, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, the other thing I, th- I think about for, like, the, the daguerreotype, um, and this kind of just occurred to me, um, in 2017, when I read about the, um, tr- it's called a Trillin Nova, or like, it's basically, it's, it's kind of like a supernova, like two supernova colliding or something. Mm. They detect one in 2017, or through the map, they, um, speculate that one happened in our universe. And in this article, they were talking about like, this is like, where heavy metals comes from, right? Because these heavy metals are not produced on Earth, right? I mean, hmm. the gold, the silver, the platinum, all that comes from outer space. I mean, everything really comes from outer space if you go back far enough. But, like, those are carried through the cosmo dust, and they gravitate throughout time and, and you know, and and land on Earth, and you have these gold mines right mm. and that's just a beautiful thought for me that the material of working wood is like is connected to the heavens too so there is that that kind of layering of, of history mm. that goes into the material of the work one of the things that you just mentioned that uh you know is something that i think about a lot also being an asian american is is this way that I think for a lot of people, even here in California, where there are a lot of Asian American people, I think maybe in California, we might have a little bit more awareness of, um, that the general public might have a little bit more awareness of the fact that Asian Americans have been here for a while. But there is this way, I think that for even a lot of Californians, that history is very invisible. It's not something they're very aware of the thing that you were talking about with the Nevada city images being in a way about Asian American history. I find it really interesting because I think there's, there is a way that American history is Asian American history, but most people don't seem to see it that way, or at least most, most white Americans don't seem to see it that way. So I find it really kind of, um, in some ways, perhaps a radical act or, and certainly to me, a, an important and valuable act to, to find ways through the work to bring an awareness of that history into play in the, in the contemporary time. Is that something that is for you an important sort of motivating part of your work? Oh, well, definitely. I think, um, you know, when I was a college student, when I, you know, I was required through the GE requirement to take a, a history class, you know, and I decided to take an Asian American history class. Um, and it was through that class I realized that there's this great wealth of histories of, of Asian American in this country and stuff you don't learn in the mainstream. And, um, um, you know, a lot of, a lot of that history is sad, but it also a lot of it is very joyful too. And like, and I read that you yeah, actually, you're from Salinas, like, the Bing cherry, you know, that was invented by a, a Chinese man, you know, and mm. people probably don't even know that when they buy Bing cherry, you know, this yeah. form of um, cr- crossing of, of the cherry plants, you know. So I think it's, again, it's basically, I mean, American history is really rich. I mean, that's one thing I, I enjoy just learning about other groups history. And I feel like we as a country feel, especially at this time right now, we feel threatening mm. when other groups history is revealed and made more mainstream in a way. And, you know, there's that saying that I guess history is written by the, the winners, right? Mm-hmm. In a way, I mean, I feel like so many people lost throughout time. And now it's, 
their um, descendants are trying to um, rewrite these history, you know, or to reveal other history. And it's going to run out rewriting history, but it's flushing out more history to kind of complicate things. And I think that's really important because I think we try to simplify things. You know, like for me growing up as a Vietnamese American, I found out about the Vietnam War through the movies, you mm. know, and that's one way we learn about history is through these kind of movies. And, and again, a lot of it is traumatized in a way. And But it's like my parents lived through the war. I was born in Vietnam. My, you know, my brother was born in the day where South Vietnam, Vietnam fell to the north. And my parents were, in a way, ashamed to talk about the Vietnam War, you know, because they left the country they love and it wasn't something they want to talk about, especially in my own um, history, for the history of, 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 of um, refugees, right, for being a boat people coming to the U.S. and fleeing, you know, because, you know, my father was probably about 30 years old when he decided to take the family on a boat. Mm. And, and I imagine, you know, I, I wouldn't be able to comprehend and do that today if I, you know, with my, because not, there was a high risk of death, right? But he wanted to live in a country where, where, the, you know, his kid could have, um, could have opportunity and education. And so again, a lot, a lot of that is also just living this American dream for my parents. Mm. Right. Mm -hmm. And then through the arts, you know, through making the art, it's like I get to tell their stories, you know, and I, I'm I kind of pry a little bit. I <laughs> I started asking them questions and they, I mean, there's a, these amazing like stories that never. Yeah. You know, it's like like my father told me when he when the Americans left Vietnam, they left all these freezer and he took these freezer and he made ice cube for a living. Hmm. For, you know, it's like these little details. Like it's, he freeze water and so, and, and sell these ice on the street. And just a, that imagery for me. And every time I, I look at ice, you know, I just think about that story, you know, mm -hmm. and my, my mother telling me things about like being on the boat and the waves crashing and, and being attacked by, by pirates and surviving those um, events and then finding a way to a refugee camp. So again, a lot of that is through um, storytelling passing down from my parents. And then I tried to tell these stories in a photograph. Mm. The thing that you just said uh, a minute ago about learning about the war through movies one of the things that strikes me about that is that American movies about the Vietnam War are almost universally told through the stories of the white characters, whether those be American soldiers or, um, you know, Americans here, you know, maybe Americans who were uh, protesting at the time or, or things like that. Mm -hmm. And we get very little visibility through our own media and pop culture of what the experience was like for people in Vietnam who are not American, whether those be, you know, whoever in Vietnam, mm -hmm. even to the point where I think that this was your lecture. The, fir the first time I ever saw your work was when you presented a lecture at uh, the Medium Festival of Photography, which I think was about four or five years ago. Mm -hmm. And I think you were the one who... Uh, first made me aware of this, that in that in Vietnam, it's not called the Vietnam War, it's called the American War. Yes, that's correct. And I think the the degree to which people here don't even realize something like that is very striking, the way that we don't have very much access for whatever reason, whether it's because we choose not to have it or whether we have some obstacle to accessing it. We don't have access to this other perspective of this event that is such an, a pivotal and important event in American history is also a pivotal and important event in, you know, history all over the world. And certainly in Vietnam, the way that your work brings these different stories and perspectives, different faces, even 
to the narrative that we understand here, I find that a really powerful experience looking at your work. You know what I mean? Yeah, I think the, uh, well, even though the United States lost, I guess, on the governmental level, lost in Vietnam, the movie industry was able to win the Vietnam War by rewriting what happened, you know, became, became more, I guess it became more personal because of the depiction of soldiers in the war through the movies. And in a way, it marginalized, of course, as you just mentioned, it marginalized a lot of Vietnamese people Mm -hmm. who were trying to live a life during wartime. You know, those stories are are not told, you know. Mm -hmm. Uh, And that's, you know, a lot of that, of course, could be, well, Vietnam War movie is always imaginative, too, uh, in, in some way. And. It, I guess a lot of it gets into the psyche of soldiers, and but I, I mean I don't want to paint paint Vietnam War movie with a, a single brush here because some of them were interesting. Um, for me, I think my experience of again, like I, I mentioned, my experience of the, the Vietnam War itself is through the movies and the tonality. Of the like the film that was usually shot and the the uh, the greenness of the movie, it kind of relates to you know why I'm interested in landscape mm. and plants and <laughs> because again I was looking for my my own landscape you know um, and and war of course is it's always a war on the land because mm. you know when when you're sh- dropping bombs or shooting, blowing up caves or even blowing up, um, like in the Middle East, uh, blowing up Buddhist statues, you know, and mm. getting rid of these relics. I mean, that's a war on the land, you know, war on culture. And that's something that I think a lot about when I think about war photography. I do think about landscape photography. Of course, you know, we those early early landscape photographs or photographs of war, the Civil War, mm. you know. Um, anyway, yeah. <laughs> I'm not sure where to go, well, but is it all? It all, you know, it somehow it all wraps itself together. <laughs> So one of the, we've mentioned your chlorophyll prints. We haven't talked about them a whole lot. And this thing that you do where you are using the photosynthetic process of plants to literally turn a leaf into a photographic print. And I mean, I think anyone who has ever seen your work, you know, and is familiar with your work is really struck by this very unique process that you use. And something that you've talked about in other interviews is um, sort of something that we've alluded to here, the way that war, which is very much the subject of your chlorophyll prints, is something that affects the land and therefore the things that grow on and out of the land. Another thing that you mentioned um, earlier in this conversation was the ways that the the atoms that that make up our bodies or that make up the metals in the print, that these are all things that have had a long lifespan and that there is a certain immortality to them that they keep cycling mm-hmm. through. Mm-hmm. And one of the things that I was thinking about as I was thinking about your work and particularly your chlorophyll prints, you've made, you know, many, many of these uh, bodies of work and exhibitions that you've had of these chlorophyll prints have been specifically about the war in Vietnam. But you also have made work about the Civil War, the American Civil War. You've made work about um, the uh, about Cambodia. You've made work about um, the Iraq and Afghanistan wars and conflicts. So it's what's interesting to me is in sort of thinking about that subject matter of it's not just one war, but almost that war in general is a subject of your photography and Mm -hmm. taking that idea of immortality or reuse or connectedness. It almost kind of feels to me like there's this suggestion that every war is the same war. You know what I mean? And I, Mm -hmm. I, this, that there is this connection between all of these different conflicts through history. 
and looking at it in that way when I look across, you know, the scope of, of your work over time, I'm left with that very profound feeling of connectedness between all of these conflicts and how the effects of, of each of them continue to resound through the history we're making now. You know what I mean? Mm hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we think about, of course, this week um, was the anniversary of September 11. Mm hmm. You know, that launches to where we are today, which is more complication of what happened from September 11 to 2001 to Iraq 2003 to now. I have no idea what's going on now, but I, I think maybe also um, the public gets jaded with this constant war that seems like we're United States always involved with some sort of conflict mm. secretly or publicly throughout the globe. And, you know, we're always trying to insert our, our, our might and power. And I think as, as someone who lives in this country who, who pay, you know, pay his tax and everything and a lot of that money goes into destruction across the globe in a way. And I feel like I, I have to take some sort of responsibility and like remind people too that, you know, if you don't like what's happening, you have to, you have to voice up, you have to vote. So I think, I think maybe my work is, a, a, I never thought about it as a political act mm. or like, I think once a critic called my work activism, mm. you know, when I made, my first showing of the core footprints when I was a BFA student at San Jose State University in 2001, the week my show opened up was a week of September 11. Mm. And everything kind of, again, came some sort of full circle. Of course, a lot of these stuff are, I mean, you can't, you can't just, I'm not a fortune teller, I can't, but it, it like it happened in these moments where, I was just interested in the Vietnam War. I just came back from Vietnam in 1999. I, vis I visited Vietnam for a time as, um, in my life and was just fascinated with the, the remnants of the war and the landscape. And you see that in the, the war museum in Vietnam. You, you just see that in the landscape. And, and here we, we, we see, we see war through documentary and film and, there is not a sort of fiscality of the war. We don't have that here in the U.S. I think it was obviously during the Civil War when the war was actually in here in the U.S. that people experienced that. Mm. Um, we don't experience that here. We're very protected. But when we travel, you know, when one do have the option to travel across the globe and you see the, how other people live and and the condition that due to our politics um put these people lives in you know you feel i feel like there's some sort of responsibility as an american i yeah i, I mean i guess my work is just to remind people about these things and not not to forget these for example you mentioned the iraq war and a lot of that maybe are you thinking about the daguerreotypes of the crosses of lafayette yeah you know that's just uh, a landscape that I'm just fascinated with that the, this community decided to place about 3,000 crosses on a hillside um, that started in 2006, you know, three years after 2003 with the Iraq, the beginning of shock and awe and the Iraq war. And it's still there today, you know, even though it's throughout the years, there was a lot of protests against that display because people always think it, think about it, or so a group of people think about it as anti-military, you know. But I feel like anything that points to the military, even it's negative, it's never, I don't ever see it, see it as anti-military. It's just the reality of being in the military, right? Serving in war, the reality of death, you know. The, all that is just something that we talk, we should talk about. Mm. Because I think, if we're more aware 
of these things, right? We're more like understand the consequence of these action that we might not join the military, right? I mean, I, of course, a lot of it is an opportunity to get out of the situation we're in. You know, if you're from a small town and you want to escape, you know, and you want an education, you can always join the military. But, and of course, I'm not, again, criticizing that tactic, but I'm just, you know, I, I want, I want the full story, right? And for example, like during George Bush presidency, like there was a ban on photographing coffins coming back hmm. from the Middle East. I mean, there was a ban publishing photographs like that. And that's, of course, a, I mean, that's censorship in a way. That's definitely not an American thing to do. But it was because these photographs were very powerful because they're trying to control the narrative, right? I mean, that obviously happened in the Vietnam War, too, because the photographs that were came, coming out of Vietnam were depicting the reality of what was happening there. So, yeah, these, these pictures are powerful, and I, I am, I'm a true believer that art could change society. It could change hearts and minds, and that's why, you know, that's why we do it. That's why there's poets and writers and filmmakers and visual artists. Um, because I think, in a way, the profession of a creative person is also like a political act, because... It's not a traditional thing to do, you know. <laughs> mm -hmm. It's it's kind of in a way going against the grain um, of what society tells you to do, which is basically get a a nine to five job. And and you know, I do have a day job, but I am very fortunate because I do teach art. I teach what I love, and I hopefully teach it to. I mean, I teach it to a new generation of young artists, and hopefully instill that passion in them to have a creative life. And I feel like, again, just in this country, we spend so much time on, on destruction and like the cutting of, of the arts and funding, you know, all that, mm. all that kind of just troubles me because I feel like we're, we're missing another part of our full humanities if we don't have the arts. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Uh, why don't we take a quick little break and then we'll come back and do the second segment. Oh, okay. <laughs> so for the second segment, I always invite the guest to bring a topic of their own, which could be whatever you'd like to talk about, whatever happens to be on your mind. So what would you like to talk about today? Oh, well, there's a lot of stuff on my mind and maybe this could be a little snippet of things here and there. And of course, as you know, Robert Frank passed away on Monday. Yeah. And I'm just curious about when was the first time you learned about Robert Frank's work? Yeah. You know, it's funny. Um, so I don't have, um, like an art school background. Um, mm -hmm. I, my only formal education in, in, uh, photography was I took one semester of high school photography my freshman year of high school. So it was a very long time ago. Um, and I didn't become serious about photography as a practice, as an artistic practice until a couple years after my first child was born. Oh. It was probably around 2010 that I started really learning photographic mm -hmm. technique. And it wasn't until maybe a year or two after that, that I started learning a little bit about photographic history, uh, in large part due to the medium festival, which started in 2012. Mm. I think that I first became aware of Robert Frank's work um, from listening to different photo podcasts around that time, maybe 2011, 2012. And um, I think I bought my copy of The Americans, um, you know, around that time, 2012, 2013, something like that. But it's, I mean, I, it can't really be overstated, of course, how influential and important um, his work was in um, in, in photographic history and it's particularly American photographic history. It, it, um, the Americans is such an iconic body of work. Um, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. His, his loss is certainly deeply felt in the photo community. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm on Instagram and of course a lot of people <clears throat> I follow and, 
and um, who follow me are all, you know, we're all photo geeks. And <laughs> it's, it was, um, I mean, I found out about it on Instagram actually that um, Robert Frank passed away on, on Monday, September 9th, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, but I, I was just thinking because, you know, when I was um, a young art student, when my, my photo professor show us the work of Robert Frank in a beginning photo class. And yeah, I wasn't interested in the work. Mm. <laughs> it was like, it, it was interesting. Um, it, as a young student, you're just basically learning, trying to learn and learn the t- technical stuff and learn about the history of the medium. There's a, obviously a lot of other photographers that were more I- influential. Um, but it was more that my professor, his um, passion about this work kind of got me to get a second look at it and realize how strong it is. I mean, it's got kind of like the thing with like new topographic, you know, like these things in um, photo history that at the time it was kind of rejected, but then through the years, there's this like new visit on this event, like an exhibit or the book itself, the Americans. Um, but I, I just remember that my, my professor was just, he was just telling me that he saved, you know, his money just to buy this book. You know, he was like so passionate about it. And I just felt that energy <laughs> from that conversation he had with, with us in, in the class and how important the work was. Yeah, yeah. I think that's obviously that. That for me, that moment with my professor kind of left uh, this. In a way, this emotional connection to Robert Frank's work is to that someone else sharing with me Robert Frank's work. You know. Yeah. Um, I think that's kind of like I thought about that when <laughs> when I found out about you know Robert Frank's passing. Yeah. Uh, but anyway, I mean, I kind of want to just acknowledge that in our conversation today. Mm-hmm. You know, the other thing I've been really thinking about, and and this is, I've been thinking a lot about like smoke, hmm. uh, smoke, um, and due to you know all the 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 um, the news in the news today about vaping, you mm-hmm. know, the vaping con- issue of people being rushed to hospital and uh, I guess an allergic reaction to um, the, the steam or whatever it is that it's created in these vaping pin, pins that they're inhaling. And I'm just fascinated about like the power of that thing about smoke. I, I don't know if you ever thought about it, but it's like this is some sort of primal quality that, I mean, of course, a lot of it because it's the cool factor, right? And again, I don't know if you smoke or if you vape, um, <laughs> but I but don't. I, but yeah. I, I'm just fascinated because it it gets us all the time. It gets like a new generation of of kids, yeah, hooked on this aesthetic. And I I just that's just something I've been thinking a lot about because you know. Um, I mean, I'm attracted to it, but I know for the you know there's consequences in these actions, right? So I'm not going to run out and and vape or, but there's something that, of course, that smoke is like just a beautiful quality. I mean, aesthetically, that's is like the, I think that the uh, the aesthetic of something always kind of just gets us in this emotional way that all kind of like rational you know thoughts or facts about it something that you know for me like the daguerreotype i mean there's a making daguerreotype is hazardous you know oh yeah to myself. you know i mean i take every precaution with using all the up-to-date laboratory equipments and film hood but because of the quality i get on a, a, a silver plate is nothing that's reproducible in today's technology i have to do it as what is with you know in the instruction of the 19th century, yeah, it's there's just something primal about these these shiny object or smoke or water. I don't know. These are stuff that I think I'll find in my just days uh, when I when I just have some time just to think. I don't know. Any thoughts about that on your end? Yeah, I mean, 
there, I did, uh, briefly when I was in high school, I think I, I, I smoked a little bit. Um, you know, cigarettes were, uh, more common then, although not obviously not as common. This was like in the late nineties. So it wasn't like it was, you know, in the sixties <laughs> when we see mm-hmm. with like Mad Men and stuff where everybody's smoking all the time, but it was certainly a lot more common back then. Even, um, we were just, uh, the other day we were watching a movie with my kids. I think we were, it was, we were watching Mrs. Doubtfire. Oh, yeah. I <laughs> um, love the movie. <laughs> yeah. And, um, and there was this part where they go to a restaurant and the, the, the host says, uh, smoking or non-smoking. And, um, you know, it's the part where he's having to run back and forth between his boss and his family and, you know, change and all that stuff. And so he wants to make sure that the other, uh, one group is not sitting in the same section, but my kids had no idea what that meant. Like, what hmm. does that mean? Smoking section, non-smoking section. It was like back in the nineties, we didn't think anything of it. It was just normal that you would have a part that you would be able to have any part of the inside of a restaurant where you were allowed to smoke, um, is not something they have any experience with. I thought that was, well, for one thing, it made me feel really old in the moment, but, <laughs> but, but, um, it is sort of interesting to see how things have changed around that. But even so, I think you're right that, I mean, there is the cool factor. Certainly when I was a teenager, there was, that was part of it. And like the peer pressure part of it too, just that yeah. I wanted to fit in with my cool friends who were also smoking, but the aesthetic of it, I mean, part of it is cultural. When we look back at, you know, we watch Mad Men and everybody is constantly smoking. And there is, even though I think now there are per- perceptions, especially around smoking versus vaping that like there is more of a perception among younger people that it's kind of gross but I think that there is still this visual allure to it, um, watching old movies and, and, and things like that where you see it. I kind of wonder if it's, it's bigger than just cigarettes, you know, um, because I think there is this sort of primal, um, atavistic kind of attraction to fire. You know, yeah. like even when the first thing, when you said smoke, the first thing that came to my mind, um, just now wasn't cigarettes. It was actually all the wildfires that, w- that California has been having, having, um, and I remember a few years ago, uh, when we had a big fire, a series of connected fires around San Diego here, um, my wife and I were just coming home from a trip. And so we were flying into San Diego and we flew through the smoke. You could see the fire ringing the whole city. It was almost the entire city was surrounded by fire. And the way the smoke just sort of hung in the air around the city, the haze coming into the city, but, and it was terrifying, Mm -hmm. but also there was something about, you know, when you land, you get out and you're looking at the smoke on the horizon, plumes of it rising out of the earth, that it is also beautiful at the same time as it is terrifying, um, that there is some attraction to it that you can't help looking at, or at least I can't help looking at it. Um, yeah. you know, having an aesthetic response at the same time that I'm having a fear response is such a strange combination of emotions, you know? Yeah. Yeah, definitely. I mean, that's, I think that's what I'm trying to like touch upon. Like, you know, it's, I mean, we could always, I mean, we could put the cool factor aside, but like that primal quality of these for example, like waterfalls or <laughs> something, or just moving water is something that's very attractive, and we can mesmerize. And because you know, water is a signal that there's there's life, and it's a place to, I guess, on the you know when we were when humans were on the safari, you know, looking for, you know, when the population got very small, like I mean, when there was moments where in our our human um evolution where we could have been wiped off the face of this planet right Mm -hmm. but then something saved us like water like finding water this you know and that's the reason why i think they say like we're so attractive to shiny objects and jewelries and all that like you know it works it does something within our psyche i just i'm really just fascinated with that i mean that reason like you know again i don't i don't smoke but i just like love watching people you know vape mm-hmm. <laughs> you know? it's just like oh my god this is amazing it's like this 
you know, the, the, uh, the white steams kind of coming out of their, their mouth and nostril. And it's just like, they're on like on fire, you know? It's, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's interesting too. Like, you know, when you talk about vaping and smoking, how each of them look a little different from the other one. Um, huh? for me, cigarettes are always really tied to my memory of my grandfather. My mother's father smoked constantly. And so, unfortunately for me, I have this sort of, uh, nostalgic, almost romantic kind of association with the smell of old cigarettes, um, mm. because they remind me of my grandfather. And I'm happy that my kids find that smell gross because they're not <laughs> a little less likely to be engaging in it. It was actually what ended up killing my grandfather was all the cigarettes, mm -hmm. but I still can't get away from that attachment that I have to it. What's interesting to me is that, um, you know, having seen him and smelled him, uh, smoking cigarettes my whole childhood, there is a way that cigarette smoke, the way that it looks, um, is also very sort of comforting and familiar to me. Whereas mm -hmm. when I watch people vape, I, I do find that I have an aesthetic response to the way that the clouds of vapor look, but it's not the same as smoke. Like there is something sort of mm -hmm. different about the way that the vapor disperses through the air. It looks different, you know, and I don't have quite exactly the same response to it. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, it I mean, I think it, the, obviously it kind of looks cleaner, I guess, in a way, mm. because it's like this wider tones. For, at least for my, for my observation of it, um, it, there's something of obviously when I fly, I love looking at clouds. Yeah. I love it when the plane gets above the cloud and then, you know, if it's overcast and then you go above, you're, it feels like you just like, there's some sort of ground there, but it's just like this white ground. And then there's these pockets of, um, that opens up and you can really see the shape of the cloud. And I mean, that it's always been one of the, you know, the reasons why I always request the, the window seat because I enjoy just looking out and I've never understand why people don't like to look out. I don't know. I don't know. Maybe I'm going, going to weird <laughs> area, but it's just like, I don't know why people are not excited about what's happening outside. Yeah. We're flying, you know, we're also like, we could also die any moment. Too. Yeah. <laughs> but a lot of people are glued to their TVs and, and I feel like, wow, you're just, you're missing the scenery out here. <laughs> yeah. I also find myself very captivated by, by clouds and things like that. And it's interesting as a photographer because, you know, when you talk about something like a cloud or, a sunset or a waterfall. These are images that to me in the moment, I can never get away from this sort of sense of awe when I'm, when I, when I'm looking at a cloud and particularly because, you know, I'm the area of California where I grew up. Um, I grew up, uh, I, I was born in Salinas, as you mentioned, but I actually grew up outside of Carmel and the Carmel itself, or at least at the time was foggy all the time, but the, um, east of there in the valley was, uh, I think that they usually get like 300 to 320 days of sunshine a year. So there were very rarely clouds and certainly not the big sort of billowing puffy clouds that you get in the Midwest. And, you know, when I, my wife's family, her mom is from Canada. So we go visit there a lot. And when we take the plane ride there, a lot of times on the plane ride, you'll see these big, huge, amazing looking clouds that I, you just didn't see in that part of California when I was growing up. And yet as a photographer, that is a subject that is such a considered such a cliche, you know, I mean, I remember, um, a few years ago, I think, I think it was Lee Friedlander. I mean, he's always putting out new books, right? Like he's got, got like a million books and then he yeah. did a book that was just all cloud pictures. And I remember everybody in the photo community just sort of scratching their heads and going, really? Like what, <laughs> what? clouds? Okay. I guess. Mm. But I, I feel like there is that way that that sort of consternation that we all have about cliches in, in the visual arts uh -huh. has this way of denying the really primal experience that we all have, or at least that many of us have when we're viewing these things that the art world might consider a cliche, you know, and I can never uh -huh. quite square that, you know, cause uh -huh. I, I'd like to be able to, like, I want to take a picture of a cloud sometimes, you know, but it's like, I feel like, well, you know, 
can I do that as a, as a, as an artist? I don't know. <laughs> yeah. I, you know, I, even though I'm part of the, I guess I could say I'm part of the art world, but I don't ascribe to that sort of thought where I, I don't, I guess it's more generalizing of um, what art should be. Mm -hmm. I feel like just the act of making art, the first act it's for yourself because it's important, right? I mean, it was important for Lee Freelander to publish a book of clouds because that's who he is. Lee Freelander still alive? I'm not sure. I think, sure. I'm pretty sure he is. I think <laughs> oh, he yeah. just had another book like earlier this year. Oh, God, He's I'm just so constantly bad. putting books out. Okay. Okay. So the clouds are important to him. You know, I think that's for me, that's enough. <laughs> yeah. That's enough that, that that should be important for me. You know, I guess when my students come to me with these projects, I mean, I'm there with them. I'm, I'm along for the ride, you know, like, let's figure out why this is so important for you. And even though it's such a cliche topic, but there's always new things to discover in it. I mean, it's kind of like science, I guess. I mean, like all this weird exploration of, of science, you know, of, of these topics out there and it never gets boring. I, I feel mm. it matters for the, for the maker. And for me that, that just makes it worth it because again, I mean, we, we can make art, we can make pictures of clouds or our kids or waterfalls and we don't have to put it out there, right? We can make it for ourselves. We can view it. And it's about our own life's journey. You know, we could, but the nice thing about, of course, when you make things, is you could sh the idea is to share it, right? Mm -hmm. And I feel like that's what it, what Instagram is for. <laughs> yeah, I guess. <laughs> so, it's for all the cliche stuff, but we love it because it's like, wow, look at that food, or look at that really yeah. beautiful sunset, and and it was uh, just I, an hour for it. <laughs> yeah, I think the difficulty really is just in. <clears throat> it's always a, you know, sort of a lack in, in my own skill, I guess, but, you know, being able to take, you know, the picture never looks as good at, as the experience of being there. It, it, you know, that's the problem with taking pictures of stuff like clouds and sunsets and things like that is that usually, unless you're, you know, particularly good at it, the, like, there's a photographer that I follow on Instagram. His name is Delaney Allen, who often takes pictures or shares pictures of, waves or clouds or things like that only when he does it they're so dramatic they actually really do look it's very striking and um emotive and they don't feel like a cliche you know and to me that really demonstrates like if you're good enough and you can do it right then why not you know because I, I do find his photographs moving not just on a cliche level but not just because they're pretty but like i feel like there's actual emotion in it but it, i think it's really hard to take something as pretty as a cloud and be able to make a, a meaningful picture out of it you know All right All right yeah. so there's there's uh there's one question that i usually like to end with and that oh, okay that is if uh there is a piece of art or literature or creativity in some form that you've experienced recently that meant something to you oh god there's there's probably a lot, but well, you know, there's there's always Netflix. That's <laughs> <laughs> true. And I, I mean, I was able to finish some some of these series before school started because I'm not gonna have time to watch. But I finished watching Globe. Globe. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, and that that's a, it's a it's a really nice <laughs> storyline of these wrestlers and I as a kid I remember watching women wrestling too and my brother and I were very into it and we would watch it every Saturday morning and it kind of brought us back at least brought me back the series itself brought me back to those um time periods as a child yeah I haven't gotten back to, I we, my wife and I we watched the first season of that really loved it and just for some reason we haven't had time to get to the, the <laughs> yeah. newer ones but uh I yeah yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, so thank you so much for talking with me. I really enjoyed it. Oh, thank you, Mike. 
All right. Once again, if you're in the Bay Area, Ben's show After the Gold Rush will be up at Haynes Gallery in San Francisco through November 2nd, 2019. So do go and check that out. And that is our show. If there's something that you've always wanted to let me know or some question you think I might be able to answer, you can find me and the show on Twitter and Instagram at Channel Open Pod, on Facebook at Facebook.com slash Keep the Channel Open, and you can reach me via email at podcast at Keep the Channel Open.com. Sign up for the KTCO newsletter by going to Keep the Channel Open.com slash connect, and every other week you'll get updates about the show as well as a curated list of poems, essays, art, and more from around the web. And if you'd like to support the show, you can make a pledge to our Patreon campaign at patreon.com slash likewise media. Our theme music is by Poddington Bear. You can find more of his music available for licensing at soundofpicture.com. We'll be back on October 9th with a conversation with writer Liz Lenz, so stay tuned for that. And until then, remember, keep the channel open. Keep the channel open.